There are more dead towns in Colorado than there are live ones. There are hundreds of ghost towns, either preserved or undiscovered throughout Colorado. Prospectors went where the gold was or the silver, and these weren't places where towns were supposed to be. But it sure is beautiful, so you can't blame them for wanting to live there. And they often work really hard and really fast to try to be a respectable town. You could see civilization was taking hold. These are the origin stories of settlement and civilization in Colorado. This program was generously made possible by the History Colorado State Historical Fund. Supporting projects throughout the state to preserve, protect, and interpret Colorado's architectural and archaeological treasures. History Colorado State Historical Fund. Create the future. Honor the past. With support from the Denver Public Library, History Colorado, and the Colorado Office of Film, Television, and Media. With additional support from these fine organizations. And viewers like you. Thank you. A ghost town in the interior west, including Colorado, is a place where a lot of people arrived, started building things, had ambitions, and they often worked really hard and really fast to try to be a respectable town. And then, with all that effort and aspiration, it didn't work. There are approximately 400 ghost towns in Colorado, some of which only lasted a few weeks, but you can find the remnants of these communities, these remnants of hopes and dreams all through the Rocky Mountains. As Colorado became a state in 1876, mining gold, silver, coal, lead, tin, copper, that was our industry. And towns popped up throughout the West as this area was opened up from being native lands right on up until 1880. At that point, the whole western slope of Colorado became available for miners and ranchers, pioneers to come out and homestead, and also state claims. Prospectors went where the gold was. That was usually in some remote mountain canyon. So boom towns, mining boom towns, literally sprang up overnight in, in what might be a remote pine forest or a gully. And these weren't places where towns were supposed to be. So these towns would be sloped or terraced. Mining boom towns were very much a product of this idea of get rich and get out. When the towns flashed up into existence, they were very quickly thrown together. Log cabins and even tents with dirt floors. Most of the towns burned at some point or another. Ghost town aficionados talk about three phases of a ghost town. The first phase is when it's a tent city. You have a city of canvas and of logs. The second phase only takes place if the mineral resources are good enough to sustain the town. And after a while, if you can get enough people into the town, you can build a sawmill and you start building a timber and frame community. You begin to see the false fronted buildings replacing the log cabins or the, the tents. Very often, that's the point where the town had, had its big fire, right? When you build this wooden town that was very susceptible to burning down. The third phase of a town is a brick and stone community. And if you can survive long enough to reach that phase, those are the towns which tend to have the most permanence. The mining industry in the West really increased the likelihood of people racing into incredibly remote, incredibly difficult to get to areas, creating towns. For any of these reasons, the towns might decline. And once that happens, people simply move elsewhere in search of new opportunities. What's left behind? Well, abandoned buildings that are exposed to rain and snow and wind, are susceptible to relic hunters. And so these towns are sort of pulled apart by weather, by natural and human forces, until there may be nothing left except for remnant spots of berry bushes where people had their gardens. Dr. and California 49er Abner Ellis Wright was the first prospector to set his sights on what later became St. Elmo. As legend has it, Wright was attacked by a bear during his journeys out west. The doctor brought the animal to the ground with his knife, only to have his ear shot off by his companions, who were clearly not skilled with a hunting rifle. In 1871, with knowledge of California's gold veins, Dr. Wright stumbled upon this stunning location. 
nestled 1,000 feet beneath timberline in Colorado's South Central Mountains. St. Elmo is located in the upper Arkansas River Valley in Chaffee County today on the slopes of Mount Princeton. When the town was originally established in 1880, it was named for a city because there are so many trees around here. But unfortunately, California also had a town by the name of Forest City. Postal system requested that the name be changed. And local lore is that someone was reading the book by Augusta Evans called St. Elmo and that the town was renamed. Almost all the buildings you see in St. Elmo are actually just two layers of one inch boards nailed together. If they're really ambitious, they'd put newspaper between the boards. That was the insulation. And that actually held up the entire building, which given the fact there'd be six or seven feet of snow in the winter is quite amazing. They had wood stoves. So when you cranked up your fire, it was either hot or cold. And it didn't really matter the insulation and at the end of the day. Primary ways to get up here before rail service came through was by foot or by horseback or on the stage. It was a bumpy long ride from Dina Vista. When you got off the stage, you could come and have a wonderful meal somewhere and find lodging and stay inside. At one time, Chafee County St. Elmo was a bustling and thriving railroad town and mining settlement. With a population of over 1,500, the town served as a supply stop and a hub for shipping ore from one of the area's mines to the closest smelter. But life was not easy at nearly 10,000 feet. The community of St. Elmo faced miserable winters with never-ending snowstorms and unreliable discoveries from the many surrounding mines. Mining boom towns are so fascinating because they're these little islands of urban life in the middle of a, a wilderness, right? And to even provide the infrastructure to allow communities like St. Elmo to persist takes extraordinary effort. There was interest in hard rock mining here in the 1870s. And one of the most prolific mine here was the Mary Murphy, which was actually found in 1873. But it wasn't until 1880 that the town was actually platted as a town site. And during the 1880s through early 1890s, there were a significant amount of people here searching for gold to supply goods to the miners. But the key element in St. Elmo was the decision by the Denver South Park and Pacific to run their railroad line through this canyon and through the Alpine Tunnel. Before the railroad arrived, you brought in all of your supplies on the backs of mules. They couldn't grow things at St. Elmo, so all of their food was imported. All of their ores had to be exported to smelters. The arrival of the railroad provided some stability. A lot of railroad workers lived in St. Elmo, and that provided sort of a, a core of stability. St. Elmo quickly usurped Alpine in population and businesses, and many of the people in Alpine moved their businesses here. Railroading was a tremendous boom for the community because you could get all sorts of goods via the railroad. And it also offered a easy way for some of the mines to send their processed ore to smelters. Life was a constant struggle, particularly because despite any of the amenities that they had, the gold miners still had to struggle with very remote locations of the mines, the remote location of their towns, harsh winters, dry summers, forest fires. Unfortunately, it was short-lived. The Alpine Tunnel was abandoned in the 19 teens, so it had a very short lifespan. And with the demise of railroad service to the Western Slope, it was just not as profitable for the railroads to continue this line. And when the railroad wanted to just close down, the citizens really put up a good fight to keep it, and they lost. In the mid-1920s, the railroad was abandoned, which kind of sealed the fate for St. Elmo. And so it's really unique amongst ghost towns and mining towns in Colorado in that all the buildings that we see date within a 10 year period. And that's what really makes it unique amongst ghost towns in the Western United States. To the West, Animus Forks tells a similar boom and bust story. 
high above timberline. There are very few Colorado communities more remote than Animas Forks. Animas Forks is located more than two miles above sea level. It was founded in 1880, and it was really quite the metropolis for its time. There were only maybe 500 residents at its peak. It is one of the most difficult and challenging places you could build a town. This is a place where the entire population had to leave in the winter because the snows were so ferocious. Very often the people who lived there would winter in Silverton, which is only 9,318 feet, much more temperate. <laughs> You're above timberline in Animas Forks. Even in the summertime, this is a very challenging place to live because of the altitude. The silver region surrounding Animas Forks opened up in the early 1870s after the forced removal of the Utes during the Bruneau Agreement. This was all Ute land and used as a summer hunting area by the Ute Indian people for generations, if not centuries. But after the Bruneau Agreement of 1873, the land is opened up for silver mining. And so prospectors go literally everywhere. They, they search every canyon, every crevasse, um, every slope for signs of gold and silver. There were some early strikes of gold around Animus Forks very early on, around 1873, and it drew prospectors from all over the region to see if they couldn't strike it rich. And if you find gold and silver in a place like this, and it seemed like your fortune was assured, and so William Duncan, who was a prospector, he was also a, a postal carrier, arrives and, and builds this lavish two-story Victorian house as a sign of permanence. Mr. Duncan and his family, after building this house, were out of there by 1879. I think the Duncan house is the sort of the last word in optimism of what this community can become. For William Duncan and many others, you take one look at Los Animas and you look at the rich silver deposits and you, you think, we can live the good life here. To get to the mines, you have to climb steep slopes and miners have to become very inventive in creating technology that allow them to get up to the mines, to excavate the mines and to bring the ore back down. The Gold Prince was high up in California Gulch and there was a big tramway that brought ore to a big mill that was built in 1904. It was the first all steel mill in the United States. The development of tram systems become the forerunners of our modern ski lifts. It's been said about mining in Los Animas and in the San Juan Mountains that in order to be a good miner, first you had to be a good mountaineer. It was such a hot strike that Otto Mears was persuaded to extend the railroad from Eureka to Animus Forks, a very steep grade. The irony of it all, and it's so true in all of mining country, is that it ran for less than 10 years. Animus Forks actually had a couple of saloons, it had a meat market, it had a hotel, it had a boarding house, it actually had its own newspaper, the Animus Forks Pioneer. It's the highest newspaper in the world. And newspapers are the voice of the community. And so the fact that Animus Forks, this very, very remote community, had its own newspaper is remarkable, but it's also essential to the future of the community. This was beginning to look like a stable community. It was also an urban center in the middle of the wilderness. By 1884, it became more apparent to the community leaders that the town needed a jail. And so in 1884, the town fathers built a board-on-board -board construction jail, a very sturdy jail built out of two-by-fours laid flat, so you have four-inch thick walls with a double-layered roof on top, as escape-proof as they could make it, so much so that the building still persists today. In 1891, there was a big fire in downtown Animus Forks and wiped out a good bit of the downtown area. Those buildings never were really ever rebuilt and Animus Forks really declined after that. The Gold Prince Mill closed in about 1912, and all of that expense of building a brand new mill and extending the railroad was for naught. There was really no future for Animus Forks. The legacy of Animus Forks is the fact that people, their spirits are indomitable. Many of them were immigrants. A lot of them didn't even speak English. 
and it's just a testament to their toughness, their stubbornness, to their aspiration for a new life in a new country so far away from wherever they grew up. It's quite monumental, I think. It's just striking. The inevitable boom and bust cycle was repeated from mining town to mining town across Colorado. The town of Ashcroft was one of the quickest to grow and the quickest to fail. 1879, the same year as Aspen's founding, two prospectors from Leadville, a man named Charles Crazy Culver and W.F. Coxhead, arrived at the Castle Creek Valley and they began prospecting and finding evidence of a very rich silver mines. They laid out their own community, a community that was originally known as Castle Forks, and then briefly as Chloride, and not a very romantic name, before they settled on the name of Ashcroft. And there are many ideas of how Ashcroft became to be the name. One being that there was a gentleman here named Mr. Ashcraft, and somebody could have just spelled it wrong. Or a croft, I guess in English, the Queen's English, is a large open meadow. And there is a large open meadow here surrounded by trees that perhaps could have been mistooken for ash trees. And so that was the name that stuck in this community, better than chloride anyway. The first few gentlemen into town here staked out the claims. Land was free, it was for the taking. So they came and platted out the town and then began selling lots for $5. Ashcroft is a really great case of an instant city. It's a place that is just a high mountain riparian valley one day and the next day it is a town complete with saloons and blacksmith shops and hotels and dance halls and grocery stores and a post office. This town had 20 saloons. It wasn't just that everyone wanted to drink at the end of the day, but heating one building with 30 people inside of it was easier than 30 people going to their individual homes and heating them. They did add false fronts to some of the buildings. So our mercantile store and our post office both had the false front and you don't realize there's only a small building behind it. It's marketing. The trajectory of Ashcroft was very bright and very brief. The mine claims in Aspen were proving to be richer with silver ore than the claims that were out here. And when the railroad arrived in Aspen in the mid-1880s, that really spelled the end of Ashcroft. The railroad company decided not to build up to Ashcroft, which meant that freight prices were going to stay permanently high. And as a result, by 1890, Ashcroft was done. So people began to quite literally lift their homes onto a wagon and horse and carriage pull their homes that they had built down into Aspen. Within the space of maybe seven years, this town was founded, it boomed, it collapsed. The path of the railroad determined the fate of many Colorado mining towns. While these locations did not transform into the prosperous towns and cities that bask in their mining history with new found industries, such as outdoor recreation, their ghostly, preserved buildings remain top destinations for preservationists and heritage tourism lovers from all over. Animus Forks is a ghost town, but you'd never know it if you were up there on any summer day. There's probably more tourists per hour than ever lived in Animus Forks. Working at Ashcroft, that half the time you're Henry David Thoreau and the other half of the time you're P.T. Barnum. In between those times, in the summertime, 150, 200, 300 people a day come through this community. These towns are loved to death. At the Animus Forks, when we were doing our stabilization projects, we actually had to think crowd management, not just preservation of the buildings, but actually where they were supposed to walk. 99% of the people are wonderful and they just love Animus Forks and they love the high country. But there are that 1% that draw their names, chip their names into the wood on the insides of buildings, who take boards off as a souvenir or to use as old barn wood. And that's a shame. We were seeing more and more things like this where people weren't necessarily thinking that these were historic buildings. Unfortunately, we suffered a massive fire here in 2002, which took out five buildings, including the town hall and jail, and two other residences, a barn, a garage, and my favorite, a series of seven original outhouses. They were just wonderful. Those buildings are connecting ties of a very immediate and distant at the same time. So when we have 
a chance to be in direct material relationship with people who can't speak or act anymore on their own behalf. It's just on the borders of religious meaning. But they were alive and they were living there and to say, we won't let that vanish. In St. Elmo, the Marie cabin that we did in the early 80s really taught me the pleasure of preservation and 40 years later I go back to it and it's still there. It's very rewarding. The American House Hotel, our current project, was quite a challenge in that there was only a roof and the four walls that were only two inches thick with no floor and we had to lift it up, put a new floor in it and preserve it as it is. The most special thing about all of these buildings is that they retain their original floor coverings, wallpaper, just a note that someone may have written and tacked up on the wall, it's still there. There's incredible wallpaper in many of the buildings. Some of it is like the raised grain, really wild colors that you wouldn't have expected in the 1890s. St. Elmo is just an incredible example of early vernacular mining town architecture. It's just tremendous. And the false fronts that are here are original. We don't intend to paint the buildings like they were, so they won't be brand new gingerbread. They'll still be the worn weather. And so we're, we're trying to save the town as it is, like you see it, a ghost town. An amazing one, quite frankly. That's why we really wanted to put the boardwalks back in, give the visiting public a sense of what this community looked like in 1880 or 1890. Now, if you do go to Ashcroft today, there are a number of buildings that are original. The, the old Blue Mirror Saloon, where Dan Sawyer, the last mayor of Ashcroft, held court, where all of the old timers would come in and tell their tall tales. You can still go in there and see remnants of the original cloth wallpaper on the walls of that saloon. You can go to the Hotel View, this beautiful two-story frame building built with sort of gingerbread lacing on the front of it was the primary hotel of the community. All of these buildings have layers of history and mythology that, that have accreted on them over time to create our understanding of a community that was a real community with sort of a mythical set of origin stories. A few of them, however, we are just letting deteriorate so that you can actually see what would happen to a building being left out in the snow and the cold and the rain and the heat. But others we do maintain with keeping roofs on them and trying to keep them preserved so that the next generation will be able to come out and enjoy the same historic value that we have today. One big factor that, that puts a town out of operation is remoteness and distance and difficulty of access. So it takes quite a commitment to go visit some of the towns. So then the people who revere the stories of the pioneer past, those ghost towns become really places of pilgrimage. The buildings in St. Elmo and almost every mining camp were only meant to last 20 years. So all the buildings, the 137 year old buildings we're working on, were only intended to last a very short period of time. And to save that history is just awesome. About the early 90s, we decided that we were going to take on Animus Works as a project. And that's when we started our stabilization. But it is, it is a definite contrast that it booms and it busts and it's gone as a place where human beings do more than visit. Through record snowfalls, lazy summers, and hours of elbow grease, the mining towns that once noisily demonstrated westward expansion and the struggle for riches now serve as symbols of the Rocky Mountain past. The legacy that ghost towns give us is of our past and where we come from, our children, our descendants. We'll still need to know where we came from and why it's here. And one gentleman that I talked to said that when he was growing up, his father and his grandfather would take him to ghost towns and he wanted that for his children too. And that I think is what it's all about. As a child, my family would come up on picnics during the summer and my father was always very quick to explain to us that you enjoy these areas, but you leave everything as you found it. 
because it belonged to someone. It's a wonderful outdoor experience. It's a family thing to do, spending good family time together. Well, the buildings are technically voiceless and speechless. They're very silent speaks. They are really forceful emissaries from the past. They, they carry a message of the time that brought them into being, the people that brought them into being. They're not memorials built for those people. They're the, the actual work of those people. We go to ghost towns for evidence of the past, but that's really an incomplete view of the past. This is the beginning. These are the, the origin stories of settlement and civilization in Colorado. And the fact that these places failed while other communities survived and flourished speaks to the marginal nature of life in Colorado. But we have this beautiful valley, uh, hopefully for many generations forward, as a reminder of the ingenuity, the pioneer spirit, and the actual celebration of, you know, we care for the land today, much like the native people did. We take care of the trees and the rivers and the environment and the animals, much like the native people did. And that to me is kind of the full cycle.